Hey, Young Knack Youth, uh, it's an honor to have the opportunity to, to speak to all of you guys again today. Um, we are actually starting on a new book of the Bible today. It's the one right after the book of Leviticus. It is called the book of Numbers. Now, um, it's kind of sad that in English we translate it as numbers because um, the Hebrew translation actually means something a little bit different, actually a lot of bit different. Um, in Hebrew, it's called Bamidvar. Okay, which basically translates to in the wilderness. Okay, Bamidvar means in the wilderness. This book, okay, the book of Numbers, it's about the story of the Israelites and their trials and uh, journey through the wilderness. Okay? That's why it's called in the wilderness. Let's do a quick history lesson to catch you guys up. All right, so Israel escapes from slavery in Egypt, and then they go into the Red Sea, and then they, they part the sea, and they're able to walk across it. They make it out of that wilderness. And from there, they go down south, okay? They go down south to a specific mountain called Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai, they stay for one year, and that year is where they get the book of Leviticus. That's where God gave them the laws. Um, and so where Moses was, was given the laws from God. Um, so they stay there for a year. And then afterward, they decide to set off together. Okay, after they receive the law, they decide to set off from Mount Sinai. That is where the book of Numbers begins. It's in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. Okay, so the, it, the entire book of Numbers can be split into three basic chunks. Okay, the fir very first chapter, chapters 1 all the way to chapter 10. In fact, I'm going to have a diagram here just to help you guys understand it a little bit better. Um, chapters 1 through 10, that's the wilderness that's in Sinai. And then chapters 10 and 12, it's like the travel period. And then they go to the wilderness in Paran. Okay, that's chapters 13 through 19. And then they have another two chapters for travel. That's 20 and 21. And then finally, it ends in the wilderness of Moab, which is chapters 22 through 36. And as you can see, most of the book takes place in the wilderness. Most of the book is happening in the wilderness. And that's why we have this name in the Hebrew, Bamidvar, which means in the wilderness. Okay. Hopefully you guys... Uh, Remember this for the weeks to come because we're going to keep going through numbers. All right. So if you guys look at this map that I'm going to be showing and putting you putting up right now, um, this journey that Israel is taking from Egypt all the way to the promised land that God has promised to their forefathers, it was supposed to take about 40 days on foot, right? However, they took 40 years instead in fact, they kind of wander all along these wilderness, uh, wildernesses and just get lost and go back and forth and go everywhere. All right. As you can see by, by this map, it, it's kind of nonsensical. Why, why would they do that? They could have just walked straight up there. Right. Well, there are a couple of reasons for this, uh, because Canaan is like way up north. It's further up north on this map. Right. Um, you see, first of all. They don't have GPS during this time. There's no Google Maps. There's no MapQuest. There is no uh, Apple Maps. None of that stuff. So they're heading into dangerous enemy territory with nothing. In fact, it says that God was the one who was giving them directions. Um, the cloud of God would set off in the morning and then at night it would turn into a pillar of fire. And then that is what would guide the Israelites. And wherever that pillar stopped, that's where they would camp. So they had no idea where they were going, first of all. Okay? Um, so God was the one guiding them around in circles, which is, again, kind of confusing, right? Why, why would God do that? Um, but that's the second part. You see, their disobedience, their arrogance, their unfaithfulness to God's covenant disqualified the entire generation of Israelites from ever entering into the promised land at all. Meaning part of the reason why they were wandering around was that they didn't want to. Many of them were like, it was better in Egypt. We should have stayed slaves in Egypt. That's a very common saying throughout the book of Numbers. And God says, cool, then... I will guide you around and around in circles. And most of the first generation, in fact, all of, almost all of them die, except for two, I believe. They were Joshua and Caleb. So what happened? Because 
if if you're to take where where I spoke from last time, you know, seriously, which was Leviticus, there was this law that was supposed to make them holy. You know, there was this law that they were supposed to follow, and then it would make them holy and and make them faithful to God's covenant. So, what the heck happened? Like that, that makes no sense. And when we look at our passage today, I think it, it gives us a better understanding of what might have happened. Okay, um, it's a description. Okay? Today, it's uh, the passage today. Technically, is all of Numbers chapter two, um, and it's a description of how the Israelites were supposed to set up camp. Now, why is this important? Um, well, I'm going to explain that in a little bit, but. If you can, please go ahead and read all of Numbers chapter 2 on your own time if you would like. Tonight, uh, today, I'm actually going to just read the first or the last verse of the chapter. Okay, so let's read it all together. That's Numbers chapter 2, verse 34. I'm going to have it come up on the screen right now, too. <sighs> Thus did the people of Israel, according to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so they camped by their standards, and so they set out each one in his clan, according to his father's house. Okay, so instead of verbally reading out the whole chapter for you guys, I'm just going to put it in a diagram. I'll put it up right now on the screen. This is what it looked like when they set up camp. They would, they would um, put each of these tribes around in a, in a square or a circle formation, whichever way you want to look at it. And then in the very center, they would put the tent of meeting. Okay, if you guys remember from Leviticus, where was the presence of God? Yeah, obviously this is a recording, so I just waited. Um, kind of felt like Dora the Explorer. <laughs> but where, where, was the t where was the presence of God? It was in the Holy of Holies, which was in the Tent of Meeting. So God's presence was right in the middle of the Israelite camp, right? Um, this, is, this is an important detail that the author of Numbers intentionally left in. Why did God have the Israelites camp like this? Well, you see, it was a symbol. It was a symbol. It was supposed to show all the other nations of the world that for the Israelites, God was in the center. He was in their midst. He literally lived with them. Th this was very different from all the other gods uh, of the ancient um, Middle Eastern area. Those gods, they lived in temples, and they never mingled with the people. They never came down to the people. But for God, his intention, his purpose was, Israel, I want you to remember me. You see, you are not living by yourselves. You live with me. I am in your midst. You are my people, and I am your God. And it wasn't just this tent in the center as a symbol. If you remember, um, like I said, Israel was being guided by a giant pillar of cloud by day. And at nighttime, it was a pillar of fire that would move in order to show them which direction to go. This is crazy. Because it is in this type of environment, it is in this setting, where they're so close to the presence of God, that the Israelites disobey everything that God commanded them. And not just disobey, they also uh, have some of the most irresponsible, selfish, and altogether most sinful experiences and attitudes that you've ever seen. They complain about not being fed. They complain about not having water over and over again. They complain about Moses being their leader. In fact, they, they complain about the, the wilderness life not being as nice as the slave life in Egypt. That's horrible. And some of them even try to go back to Egypt. And this, again, is all being done with God in the center, with God in the center of their camp, with a cloud guiding them and a pillar of fire guiding them. Every day. What the heck happened? Because you look at all of this and you go, according to all human logic, it should have worked out. It should have been okay. They should have been able to follow the laws. They, they saw God. They had God in the middle of their camp. What, what, what happened? Where did they go wrong? And I want to point out two applications that I feel like we can, we can pull from this passage. Two things that I think it teaches us about God and about our lives. 
The first lesson is that God wants you to keep him at the center of your life. God wants you to keep him at the center of your life. I'm sure many of us have heard this before. I mean, it's not my first time. I've heard pastors preach this over and over again to me when I was growing up, when I was your age. Keeping God at the center. There's a whole song about it, right? Oh, Christ, me the center. I don't know. That's really old. Nobody knows it, probably. It's Charlie Hall. You can look it up. It's called Center. What am I, what am I talking about? Uh, <laughs> but... I, why do I bring this up? Well, I, I bring it up because I really wonder, like I question, how many of us actually do this? How many of us actually put God in the center of our lives? I mean, yeah, he's there. Yeah, I know I'm supposed to live for him. But what does that mean? What is that supposed to mean? What, what does it mean to live for God? What does it mean to put God in the center? I want to challenge this notion, the popular notion, that you have God in the middle or center of your life as long as you just remember that he's there. And as long as you put him on a list of imaginary priorities, it's all good. It's chill. It's okay. That's all I need to do. I need to put God on my list of priorities and everything's fine. But let me point out to you again in our passage, where is God in the camp? Is he at the head of like a long train? No. God is in the center. He's in the middle. God is at the very center. And there's a reason for this. It's because God doesn't want to be the, 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 the first in a list of priorities, in a long list or train of priorities. God wants to be at the center, the very middle of all of your priorities, of your entire life. Meaning he wants to be involved in every single decision, in every single choice that you ever make. He wants to be intimately involved with every detail of your life, every decision that relates to you. Now, let me ask this question. How many of you seniors, how many of you seniors thought about what God wants when it comes to choosing your college? Or was it about where do you want to go? What kind of college experience do I want to have? What kind of education do I want to get? How many of you who are currently students Think about what God wants when you wake up and get dressed for the day. Or is it about how other people are going to see you? What kind of outfit you're going to wear so that other people will give you attention? How many of you consider what God desires even one time throughout your entire week? I want to make it clear. Um, I'm not giving you a roadmap of decisions and choices you should make. In fact, as I get older, more often than not, I feel like when I ask God what he wants, God says, Kevin, I trust you. Make a decision and go with it. I will be with you. There's a lot of times where I feel like God wants me to make decisions for myself in order to help me learn, to mature, to grow. But what I am questioning, it, it's, not, it's not what decisions you're making. Because ultimately, your choices are your choices. It's how do you make those choices? How do you make those decisions? Are you putting God in the center of those decisions? Okay, putting God in the center of all of those decisions, that's not an overnight thing. It doesn't just happen. And it also doesn't happen just because you get older. Because there are some of you, I bet, there are some of you watching this right now who go, oh, when I get older, I'll put God at the center. Right now, it's, it's, I got to focus on me. I got to do me right now. I got school. I got relationships. I got, I got friends. I got, I got college to, to look forward to. I got whatever else, Right? Right now, I got to focus on me. I'll put God in the center when I'm older. Do you know how I know that you guys are asking this question? It's because I have friends who are my age, who are 30, 32, 33, 34, who are still asking that same question, who are still saying, 
one day, one day I'll put God at the center. Not right now, though. I got to do me right now. I got a career. I got a job. I got to get ahead at my company. It doesn't just happen one day. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm sure many of you have families with parents who really care about what God says and really desire what God wants in your life. However, am I wrong if I say that many of our families probably don't consider God at all? In fact, I've seen families come to church and pray regularly, but God is never mentioned or thought of in any part of their decision-making process for their future. Especially when it comes to how they interact with the rest of the world. It's just study, study, study. Make money. Be comfortable. Be rich. And then when their children grow up, and then they're like so focused on their career, and, and, and they're so focused on making more money, saving up, getting a house, but then they've forgotten about God. They stop coming out to church. They just kind of know God is somewhere in the background. And the parents say, why don't you love Jesus? Why don't you know the Lord? Why don't you go to church? What's the difference between a family like that and a family that has continued to keep God at the center? A family that puts God at the center of their lives and their decisions, their children grow up learning that God should be at the center. That God should be consulted. That God should be thought of when they're making decisions. So families that put God in the center generally, most likely, will produce children that put God at the center. Families that do not consider God's desires, their children probably won't. It's really hard. It's very difficult to convince a child that was not raised that way to come out onto the other side. So the same goes for you. If you guys continue to put your needs, your desires, your choices, and never even once consider God's, that is the type of parent you will become. It, it just That's just how it is. Because again, it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen in, in two days or a week. It takes years of effort If you live your life asking God for his opinion, if you live your life asking God to shape you and mold you, if you humble yourself to his desires, then the fruits and the results of your life will be glorifying and beautiful to God. Don't be the celebrity Christian. Okay? I, call, I call the celebrity Christians... Because I see celebrities who live however they want, making whatever decisions they want, whatever choices they want, whatever actions they want to take. And at the end, they go get their Oscar or whatever the award is at the Grammys. And then they get up on stage and then they go, I want to thank God. Like, can you imagine God just sitting there going like, what? You haven't spoken to me in years. You never asked me about anything. You never asked me about your divorce. You never asked me about your, your, how to raise your children. You never asked me about anything. You don't care for my people in church. You're going to stand up there. Do you think I care that you got a Grammy? Man. If you aren't speaking to God and thinking about what he wants now, what makes you think that you will lead a business with God in mind one day? Or that you have a relationship with a future boyfriend or girlfriend with God in the center of that. What makes you think that you'll suddenly start just because you're older if you refuse to start now? And the simple answer to that is you probably won't. And that leads me to my second and my final point. The second point is that God's presence in your life will not stop your sin. God's presence in your life will not stop your sin. You see, you are not as strong as you think you are. The Israelites literally had a daily visual reminder that God was in their presence, that God was there in their camp. 
every day. And yet, in that wilderness, they failed. And they didn't just fail. They failed miserably. They failed epically. These were the same people who watched the Red Sea get split in two. These are the same people who saw the ten plagues of Egypt come and ravage that entire land. These are the same people who watched God's presence thundering and clouding over the top of Mount Sinai as Moses brought the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments down. These are the same people. The same people who complained, who told God that they didn't care about them. In their arrogance, they told God that they didn't want them, that they didn't want him. God's presence was with them. God literally traveled with them, and yet they sinned. God's presence didn't stop them from sinning. Do you know why? Because that's not the point of God's presence. God chose to be present with his people because he loved them. Because he wanted to care for them. He wanted to directly be there with them. He wanted to be their God. Not to make them perfect. He knew we would mess up. In fact, he knew so well that we wouldn't keep his commands that a big chunk of the sacrifices in Leviticus are about sin. It's about making atonement for sin. It's for when you mess up, it's how to say sorry. There's a reason for that. God knew we would have to say sorry over and over and over again. He knew we couldn't keep it. That wasn't the point. But I believe that there are a lot of you who don't understand this. Because there are a lot of you right now who are watching and thinking, "Uh, if God just gave me a really great experience, if God just met me one time and convinced me that he's real for sure, then I'd be really serious. Don't you get it? No, you won't. How many times have you prayed a similar prayer at retreat? How many times have you had that all-encompassing, overwhelming feeling from God? And you thought, thought to yourself, God, I recommit myself to you. How long does that last? One week? Two weeks? Maybe a month or two? And you're right back to where you started. Bored, apathetic, not entertained. Why? Because God has already revealed himself to us through his son, Jesus Christ. God has already made himself known to us through his son, Jesus Christ. If you are expecting some other supernatural experience or miracle, that'll convince you to take God seriously, then you're just lying to yourself. That experience is not going to draw you to God. God could heal you from flipping cancer and still Scripture says that that healing is not what draws you to God's presence. That healing is not what draws you to repentance. It's his love for us, revealed to us in his son, Christ Jesus. You'll be looking for that entertainment, that feeling, that warm fuzziness, that miraculous experience for the rest of your life. And God will never feel satisfying to you because you're looking for the wrong thing. Because it's not about miracles. It's not God's power that draws us to him. It's his kindness, his gentleness, his love, his acceptance, his mercy. Shown to us through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So if you're here because you want to become a better person. I'm sorry, you're barking up the wrong tree. If you're here because you think God will make you successful. I'm sorry, you're in the wrong place. If you want something that will give you life purpose or give, make you passionate or make life seem less boring, I'm sorry, this is not the place for that. And those are things that might come if God decides to bless you, sure, but they are secondary. If that's what you're here for, you're in the wrong place. If you're here to know Jesus more, if you're here to humble yourself in God's presence, if you're here to bring glory to the greatest God in all the earth, If you're here to rejoice in his love and mercy, then you are here 
for the right reasons, then you are here in the right place. Because those things are not about you. And those reasons, the reasons that aren't about you, are the only reasons to come to the foot of Jesus. Look, it's a difficult time right now, especially in the middle of this uh, pandemic. You guys might not have retreat. You're unable to participate in all of our banquets and traditions, our parties, our hangouts that we have planned for the end of the year. Mission trips have been canceled. Many of your graduations have been canceled. I am so sorry. I sympathize with you dearly. I feel so bad. We had a lot of things planned. We, we really wanted you guys to have that send off. We really wanted to spend time with, I really wanted to spend time with you guys. And it breaks my heart that, that we can't. But I pray that we remember during this time, as we go through the book of Numbers together, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about God. It's about Jesus. It's about the Holy Spirit. And so I sincerely hope that all of us, including myself, commit our time trying to discover who God is and to dedicate ourselves to focusing on what really matters during this quarantine, during this stay-at-home order. Amen? Let's pray. God, we lift up your students to you today. We ask, Father, as we continue um, to go through this quarantine, as we continue to figure things out together as a church, may you be in our center. May you be in the midst of your people, God. We ask, Father, for you to be um, powerfully present. May your Holy Spirit alight upon our leaders and our staff as they continue to um, reach out to your students and to help them feel belonged. And at this time, I ask for all of us, God, to recommit ourselves daily, especially now, uh, so many weeks into the quarantine, I ask, Father, for you to be um, re-energizing us. Give us the strength, God, to get back up and to keep pushing forward, Lord. We thank you, God. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Bye, guys.